Angular momentum plays a very important role in physics because it is a conserved quantity. Conserved quantities are those quantities which remain constant as a system evolves until and unless some kind of an external force acts upon that system. So for example, if there is a certain body which has a rotation motion with respect to an origin or an axis, then there is a physical quantity known as angular momentum which is associated with that rotation and it will remain constant until and unless some kind of an external torque acts upon that system. Because of this very reason, angular momentum plays a very important role, not only in classical mechanics or in classical systems where you might study how planets revolve around the solar system but it also plays a very important role in quantum mechanical systems like an electron revolving around the nucleus and in case of nuclear physics also. In the case of the nucleus it is quite important to study the spin and the angular momentum of a nucleus and properties associated with that for example nuclear magnetic moment. Now when I was preparing for this video I realized that many students find the topic of angular momentum a little bit confusing because there are so many different aspects to it. First of all you have the orbital angular momentum then you have the spin angular momentum and in both these two cases you have quantization of the magnitude of the angular momentum as well as quantization of the direction of angular momentum. Because of these reasons students find it a little difficult to keep track of all of these aspects. So I thought that before I make a video on nuclear spin and angular momentum I should devote some time talking about the quantization of the magnitude and the direction of both orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum. So I have divided this topic into two parts where in the first video, in today's video, I'll talk about what quantization of angular momentum is basically and in the second video which I'll post later on, I'll talk about nuclear spin and angular momentum. So let's begin. Now before I talk about a quantum mechanical system, let's first look at a classical system because it will be easier to keep track of these different aspects of angular momentum in a classical system. So for a classical system, I have taken the simple example of the case of a solar system in which the planet Earth is revolving around the solar system. Now if you look at the angular momentum of Earth, in that case there are two kinds of angular momentum of Earth. First of all, the first angular momentum is associated with the revolution of the Earth around the Sun which is known as orbital angular momentum. Momenta. and the second angular momenta is basically associated with the rotation of the earth on its own axis which is known as the spin angular momenta. Now in the first case when we are talking about orbital angular momenta the earth is basically revolving around the sun in that case the angular momenta is given by L is equal to R cross P. So L represents the angular momenta, R represents the position vector of the earth from the axis of rotation and P represents the linear momenta associated with the Earth's motion. So basically Earth has certain orbital velocity in a direction tangential to this particular orbit then that corresponds to the linear momenta. Now what is important to understand is that the angular momenta has a direction which is perpendicular to the plane of motion of the Earth around the Sun. To understand it a little bit better, I have a 3D model that I have created. The reason I have taken a 3D model is that because this is a three-dimensional motion, however, I am drawing these diagrams on a two-dimensional blackboard, so sometimes it gets a little difficult to understand. So here I have a 3D model in which this yellow plane basically represents the plane in which the rotation or revolution is taking place and this basically arrow represents the direction of the angular momenta. So for example, if the earth is revolving around the sun, in that case the earth is basically revolving in this particular plane and the angular momenta is directed in a direction which is perpendicular to this plane itself. Now the thing that I want you to consider from this particular discussion is that angular momenta is a vector quantity so it has two components. First of all it has the magnitude which basically gives us what is the value of angular momentum and it has the direction which basically tells us in which direction the angular momenta is pointed towards. Now in the case of the solar system, the system itself does not put any restriction on the magnitude or the direction of the angular momentum. That means if for some reason the earth suddenly starts spinning at a higher velocity, in that case the magnitude of the angular momentum will increase. If for some case the angular momentum's distance from the axis increases, in that case also the angular momentum magnitude will increase. So the magnitude of the angular momentum is not restricted by the nature of the system or the physical laws themselves. 
So what I want you to understand is that the angular momenta that I have here can take any value depending upon what is the distance from the uh, axis of rotation and what is the orbital velocity of that particular object. So therefore the magnitude itself has no restrictions or I can say that it can take continuous range of values which also means that it is not quantized. The classical systems are not quantized. That means they do not take discrete values. They can take any value depending upon where the position vector is, what is the orbital velocity of the planet. There is no restriction that is put on the value of the magnitude of the orbital angular momentum. Similarly, even in the case of the direction, so basically the direction of the angular momentum is pointing perpendicular to the revolution that is taking place. Now there's a planet which can revolve in this particular plane and the angular momentum will be directed upwards there is also a possibility that there might be a planet which is revolving in this particular plane and the angular momentum is pointing in some other direction. The angular momenta can point in any direction in three dimensional space depending upon if there is a planet which is revolving in that particular plane. There is no restriction that is put in the direction of the angular momenta and so we can say that the direction also has no restriction and therefore it can take any values or any direction in space or it is not quantized. A given planet can revolve in any elliptical plane and it can have any direction of angular momentum pointing in any direction in three dimensional space. Similarly, if I move ahead to the next topic, which is spin angular momenta, where the earth as a body itself is spinning on its own axis passing through its center. In that case, also we will have two aspects, the magnitude of the angular momenta and the direction. So the magnitude basically gives us an idea about what is the uh, moment of inertia or what is the angular velocity with which the earth is spinning. If the earth suddenly starts spinning at a very high velocity in that case the magnitude of the angular momenta will increase there is no restriction whatsoever that is put on the value of the magnitude of the angular momenta for the case of the spin angular momenta also similarly a planet might be rotating in this particular direction some other planet might be rotating in this particular direction some other planet might be rotating in this particular direction or this particular direction the system itself puts no restriction whatsoever in the direction in which the planet can be uh, depending upon the evolution of the solar system you can have many different planets spinning on different uh, axes in different directions also so the direction of the spin angular momenta also has no restriction that means it can be directed in any direction depending upon what kind of a planet is spinning in what sort of an axis so this is the crucial point of distinction that i want to particularly make that in classical physics you have these four aspects first of all you have the orbital angular momenta and you have the spin angular momenta in both these two cases you have the magnitude and the direction and the magnitude and the direction and none of them experience any kind of restrictions that means they can take continuous range of values and they can be directed in a con any direction in three-dimensional space however as we go into the quantum world when we look at a very simple example of an electron revolving around the nucleus we will see that the electron is not necessarily allowed to have any magnitude of angular momentum or to be revolving in such a manner that the angular momentum is directed in any direction in space. The electron faces a large number of restrictions which is also known as quantization. So let's look at that. The solution of the Schrodinger's equation for the case of an electron in an atom results in certain quantum numbers and these quantum numbers put restrictions on the magnitude and the direction of the angular momenta of that particular electron. So let's first look at the orbital angular momenta of an electron. So an electron is revolving around the nucleus and because of that it has an orbital angular momentum L and the magnitude of L is basically restricted by this particular equation which comes from the solution of the Schrodinger's equation and it is given as the magnitude of L is equal to root over a small l l plus 1 h cross where small l is basically the azimuthal quantum number which can have values of 0, 1, 2 up to n minus 
1. So this expression comes purely from the solutions of the Schrodinger's equation and L simply represents different integral values up to n minus 1. Now these leads to different kinds of orbitals as you already probably know for L is equal to 0 you have the small s orbital for L is equal to 1 you have the p orbital for L is equal to 2 you have the d orbital and so on and so forth. So this equation uh, for the magnitude of the angular momentum basically results in quantization of the angular angular momentum because the angular momentum now is restricted to certain allowed values only. It cannot take a continuous range of values. It can only take certain allowed values which is allowed by this particular equation. So for example, let's look at the s orbital. So if s for the case of s orbital, you have a zimital quantum number l is equal to 0. In that case, the total magnitude of the angular momentum would be equal to root over 0, 0 plus 1 h cross which is equal to 0. So for the case of s orbital the angular momentum of that particular electron would basically be equal to 0 units. For the case of p orbital similarly you have l is equal to 1 and you have the magnitude of the angular momentum would basically be equal to root over 1 1 plus 1 h cross which leads to root 2 h cross. So the magnitude of the angular orbital angular momenta for an electron in the p orbital would can only have values of root 2 h cross and for the case of d orbital you have small l can have values of 2 so this leads to angular momenta having a magnitude of 2 2 plus 1 which leads to 3 into 2 6 is equal to root over 6 h cross and so on and on. So as you can see the angular momenta for an electron which is revolving around the nucleus is only restricted to these particular values. So if you draw a particular diagram, so for example if you talk about increasing value of the magnitude of the angular momenta then the electron can only possess certain discrete values. So for example, it can possess values of 0, it can possess values of root 2 h cross, it can possess values of root 6 h cross and so on and on. So this is known as quantization of the magnitude of orbital angular momenta. That means the orbital angular momenta of the electron can only have values which are allowed by this particular equation. It cannot have a continuous range of values. It is restricted by these particular values only. This is known as the quantization of magnitude. Now what about the direction? Can the electron revolve around the nucleus in any given orbital plane? No, even the direction of the electron in which the electron is supposed to revolve around the nucleus is restricted by quantum mechanics. And this restriction is basically given by what is known as direction quantization or space quantization. To understand space quantization, let's look at two examples. So you basically have an electron which is, a, 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 let's suppose, a revolving around the nucleus in one given plane so that the orbital angular momenta has a particular direction and you have another electron which is revolving in a particular plane which has a this particular direction. So you have basically one direction which is this L and another direction which is this L, alright? So in this wide orbit, if an electron is revolving in, then it has an angular momenta which is going in the direction across the white line. And in this yellow orbit, if the electron is present, it has an angular momenta which is a direction in the yellow line. Now this basically results in uh, the same magnitude of the angular momenta but different directions. So if I take a z axis and I look at the component of both of these two angular momenta because now they have different directions of angular momenta, then the components will vary. So this will first one will have a component which is this let's suppose and the second one will have a component which is this as you can see here so this is the z component of the first orbit and this is the z component of the second orbit and by looking at the z component of the angular momenta of these different orbital planes we can have a quantization rule which is basically given by L z is equal to m l h cross. L z is equal to m l h cross. Well, m l is another quantum number whose values are given by minus l minus l minus 1 up to 0 and then up to 
L. So ML can take values from minus L up to L with a difference of plus minus one. So this equation basically puts restrictions on the direction in which a particular electron orbital plane can orient itself in space because it basically gives you the Z component of the angular momentum of that particular plane. To understand this a little bit better, let's take the example of the P orbital here and let's look at this particular diagram. Now for the case of a P orbital, the azimuthal quantum number L has a value of 1. So for L is equal to 1, ML which is the magnetic quantum number can have values of minus 1, 0 and plus 1. So ML can have three values minus 1, 0 and plus 1 and therefore the LZ component of the angular momentum can have values of minus 1 into H cross, 0 into H cross and 1 into H cross. That means the Z component of the angular momentum can only have three values for the case of a P orbital minus H cross, 0 and plus H cross. Now what does that mean in reality with respect to the motion of the electron? Now to look at that let's look at this 3d model again now since the electrons motion is happening in three dimensional space so I can draw the entire motion of the electron in this particular diagram but sometimes students find it a little difficult to understand what is happening in this diagram itself so let's look at this on case basis so let's first take the example of LZ is equal to H cross so LZ is basically the Z component along a particular Z axis but what is the Z axis really now Z axis is some any standard axis that we take to so that we find the component of an angular momentum with respect to the z-axis. Now that z-axis could be some kind of an external magnetic field. So if I put this kind of an electron system in an external magnetic field, the electron has a motion, the electron is a charged particle, it has a magnetic moment. So it will orient itself in certain particular directions. So every time this kind of an electron system is put in the presence of an external magnetic field, we can assume that the magnetic field direction is the z-axis and the electron orbit will orient itself in such a manner that the z component of its angular momentum with respect to that z axis will only have these three values. Now what does that mean? So let's first look at the case of LZ is equal to plus H cross. So in the case of LZ is equal to plus H cross, you have the electron which is going like this. So the electron is revolving in its elliptical plane and it is an angular momentum which has this direction. So yellow plane here represents the orbital plane in which the electron is revolving around the nucleus and this white arrow represents the direction of the angular momentum. So you can see that this is the direction of the angular momentum and if the z axis in this particular direction then the z component is basically equal to LZ is equal to plus H cross. However, in three dimensional space it is possible for the electron to have many different orientations so that the z component is the same. In fact, all of these orientations in which the z component is the same is basically a conical section. So you see here this particular conical section that means the electron orbit can be in all of these directions so that the z component is exactly the same. This is known as precising of the electron orbit. That means the electron orbit can precess along uh, with respect to the z axis so that the z component have this particular value. So basically the electron is going around in an orbit so that its angular momentum is precising around the z axis in such a manner that the z component is equal to h cross. Now there are three different possible values of LZ. Yes, the second possible value is zero. What does zero mean? If this is the Z axis, then zero simply means that the angular momentum is in a direction perpendicular to that of the Z axis. That means the electron can precess in this particular direction so that the Z component is always zero. So that means the electron orbit which is happening along this yellow plane, this is the orbital plane of the electron and the direction of the angular momentum is perpendicular to the Z axis. So this electron orbit will precess in this particular manner so that the Z component of the angular momentum will always be zero along the Z axis. Similarly for the third case you have LZ is equal to minus H cross. So minus H cross is in the opposite direction. So the electron is basically in this particular direction. So the electron orbit will be precessing in this particular conical section so that the component of the uh, angular momentum is exactly equal to minus H cross. This is a diagram usually the students find a little bit difficult to understand. Think of it in terms of 3D visualization. The LZ component can have a certain fixed value for a particular conical section. So there are three different conical sections which put a restriction onto the direction of the angular momentum of the electron orbit. So the electron orbit for a P orbital is restricted to these three different 
values of the LZ component or these three different conical sections so that the electron will precess around either plus H cross value, it will precess around either LZ is equal to zero value or it will precess around either LZ is equal to minus H cross value. Thus you can see this is known as the quantization of the direction of the angular momentum or space quantization. That means even the direction of the angular momentum of the electron is restricted to certain precision happening around the Z axis. So not only the magnitude is restricted to certain values that the electron can have in its orbital angular momentum it can also have directions only which are allowed by this particular expression where the z component of the angular momentum is restricted to certain values in the case of p orbital you have three different values in the case of d orbital you have five values in the case of f orbital you have many more values and so on and so forth now this was all related to the orbital motion of the electron revolving around the nucleus. This is not the only angular momentum of an electron. The electron also has a spin angular momentum of its own. Let's look at that. Now the quantization of spin angular momentum is a little bit easier to understand because it has a similar relationship that we used in the case of orbital angular momentum. So the electron apart from revolving around the nucleus is also spinning on its own axis. In the same way that the earth revolving around the sun was also spinning on its own axis. However, this kind of analogy is not necessarily entirely correct because electron is a quantum particle which is a point mass particle and it is not necessarily spinning on its own axis in the same way the planet earth is spinning on its own axis. We use these analogies of classical mechanics only for the sake of convenience and helping us understand or visualize what is happening. But purely from a physics point of view that is not necessarily true. What is true is that the electron has as an angular momentum which is associated with spin or which is known as spin angular momentum and for the sake of convenience and discussion we will imagine that the electron is rotating on its own axis but just know that this is not entirely true as we cannot always use the analogies of classical mechanics with the quantum particles because quantum particles behave in a completely different way however what I want to focus here is that even though for the sake of speaking, electron is rotating on its own axis. This contributes towards an angular momentum of the electron and that angular momentum is also quantized with respect to its magnitude and direction. And the expression which gives you the quantization of the magnitude of this kind of a spin angular momentum is basically written as S is equal to root over small s, small s plus 1 h cross. Now what is small s here? Small s simply represents a particular quantum number and that quantum number has a value of half. Okay. Now the thing is this quantum number has only one value and therefore the angular momentum or the spin angular momentum of the electron will also have one value. So for example for small s is equal to half the spin angular momentum is equal to half into half plus one h cross which is equal to root 3 by 2 h cross. So as you can see electrons whether they are bound inside an atom or whether they are free electrons will always have an intrinsic property known as spin angular momentum associated with its existence and the magnitude of the spin angular momentum will always be root 3 by 2 h cross. In fact, other particles, other elementary particles which also have spin half have a spin angular momentum of this value associated with their existence like protons and neutrons also. What about the direction of this particular spin angular momentum? So we can look at that by looking at the z component of this particular spin angular momentum. And to do that, we have a particular relationship where the z component of this spin angular momentum is given by m s h cross where m s here is the uh, quantum number which can take values of plus minus small s. So m s can have values of plus minus half that means the z component of the spin angular momenta can have values of plus h cross by 2 and minus h cross by 2. Two. So when you look at, so only two values of the z component of the spin angular momentum is possible, plus h cross by 2 and minus h cross by 2. So these two possible values basically give you two particular orientations in space. So if you have a z axis in the same manner as we did the discussion for the orbital angular momentum case, this kind of a space quantization basically leads to two kinds of orientations where the you have one precision happening around uh, the z axis so that the z component is plus h cross by 2 and another precision 
happening around the z axis so that the z component of this conical section is minus h cross by 2. Now this kind of a space quantization and this kind of a magnitude quantization is an intrinsic sort of a property of the electron as well as other kinds of spin half particles like neutrons and protons. Now in the beginning of the video I said that angular momentum is a very important physical quantity because it is a conserved quantity. Now we have already discussed the magnitude and space quantization of the orbital angular momenta and we have now also discussed the magnitude and space quantization of the spin angular momenta. However, spin and angular momenta are not necessarily conserved quantities separately but rather the conserved quantity of an any kind of an electron system is the total angular momentum of a system which basically comes as a vector addition of these two kinds of angular momenta. So you have the orbital angular momenta, you have the spin angular momenta and the vectors some of these leads to the total angular momenta of an electron system which is the one which is conserved in a given system. So let's recap a little bit. We talked about the electron in an atom system. So the electron in an atom has two kinds of angular momenta. One is the orbital angular momenta and the other is the spin angular momenta. In the case of the orbital angular momenta, you have the angular momentum whose magnitude is quantized according to the first expression and its direction is quantized according to the second expression. So the, ang so the electron will have an orbital plane which will, which will precess around some kind of a z-axis where the z component of the angular momenta will be given by this expression. Similarly, in the spin angular momenta case, you have an electron whose spin angular momenta is equal to root 3 by 2 h cross and you have directions which are plus h cross by 2 and minus h cross by 2. Now it is seen that orbital angular momenta and spin angular momenta individually are not conserved but rather for a system what is conserved is the total angular momenta. So since these two are vector quantities the total angular momenta is basically given by j where j is nothing but the vector sum of l and s. So l here represents the orbital angular momentum and S represents the spin angular momentum and J represents the total angular momentum. Now it just so happens that these kind of quantization rules which are applicable to orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum, similar kinds of quantization rules are also applicable to the magnitude and direction of the total angular momentum. So the quantization rules which apply to the total angular momentum has uh, basically for the case of magnitude an expression which is given by j is equal to root over small j j plus 1 h cross. So this is the expression which gives quantization of the magnitude of the total angular momenta where small j is nothing but a quantum number which can have values of the quantum number l plus s or the quantum number l minus s modulus. So L as you remember is the azimuthal quantum number, S is the spin quantum number. So L can have values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and S can have values of only half. So this can either be L plus half or it can be L minus half. So let's take the case of an example and see what sort of values uh, we get. So for the case of let's suppose a p orbital. So for the case of a p orbital we already know that the azimuthal quantum number L is equal to 1. So in the case of p orbital, the total uh, uh, angular momenta quantum number j can have values of 1 plus half or 1 minus half. So this can only give us two values of 3 by 2 and half. So corresponding to these two values of small j quantum number 3 by 2 and half, we can have a total angular momentum magnitude j is equal to 3 by 2, 3 by 2 plus 1 root over h cross which is root 15 by 2 and for the case of j, small j is equal to half, you have half plus 1 half root over h cross which is root 3 by 2. So as you can see for the case of the p orbital for small l is equal to 1, you can have two values of the magnitude of the total angular momentum root 15 by 2 and root 3 by 2 as I have shown here in this case. Now similarly the direction of the total angular momenta is also quantized and it is quantized with a similar sort of a relationship. So the relationship for the quantization of the direction of the total angular momenta is basically given by the z component of the total angular momenta which is equal to mj h cross and mj can have values of mj is equal to minus j minus j minus 1 0 up to 
j. So for the example of, let's suppose uh, small j is equal to half, if small j is equal to half, in that case, mj can have values of minus half and plus half. If small j is equal to, let's suppose 3 by 2, in that case, mj can have values of minus 3 by 2, minus half, half, and 3 by 2 and we can draw a similar kind of a, uh, a circle diagram that we drew in the case of orbital angular momenta and spin angular momenta for all of these orientations so they will all correspond to certain orientations in three-dimensional space where the total angular momenta vector will precess around a z-axis so that the z component has a value which is satisfied by this particular equation so for the case of the total angular momenta, the total angular momenta will have a direction where the direction of the total angular momenta will uh, have a plane of motion which will precess around a particular z axis in such a manner then the z component will have a relationship which is given by this particular expression and only those quantized directions are allowed in space for the total angular momenta. So that is all in this particular video. We talked about the orbital angular momenta and the spin angular momenta of an electron. And also we talked about the total angular momenta. Of course, a further discussion uh, is also possible, but I'm not interested in that discussion because I am concentrating on a nuclear physics course. The reason I have given these kind of quantization rules is because similar kinds of quantization rules are also possible in nuclear physics because in nuclear physics, when we talk about the nucleus, the nucleus is consisting of particles like protons and neutrons, which also have spin half. So the total angular momentum of a nucleus is basically the vector sum of all the spin angular momenta of the individual nuclear particles as as well as the vector sum of all the orbital angular momenta of the individual nuclear particles. So and the total angular momenta also uh, uh, has certain kinds of quantization rules that we have in this particular case. So that is all as far as the discussion on quantization of angular momentum is concerned. I hope that you have learned something from the video and next time you deal with these different aspects of angular momentum you will have much more ease tackling with the different aspects of it. In my next video, I'm going to talk about nuclear spin and nuclear angular momentum. And you will see that the similar kinds of uh, quantizations of magnitude and direction also are existing in the case of nuclear particles. That's it for today. See you in the next video.